Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Why, hello again. <laughs> How you doing? All right. Oh, oh wonderful. <laughs> you look different. I don't know what. Did you get a haircut? Uh, yeah, it was by someone who didn't have a license, though. So don't don't worry. It's it's cool. Okay. <laughs> I, I I just wanted to check it. I I wanted to mention something last panel together, but I mm. didn't get the chance. But mm. I I like the new. Anyways, <laughs> I will uh, let you get to it. What? What? Okay. So, for those of you who don't know, my name's Spooky. Um, at least, as far as you're aware, that's for me to know and you to find out. Um, I've been writing for Center for State Society since June of 2020, um, and there's a few different sort of directions that I've like gone with my work, but one thing I want to really focus on today is the intersection between queerness, uh, not just, you know, in terms of gender, sexual, or romantic minorities, but also just the concept of queerness as a whole. I'll try to keep this not as much of a philosophy lecture because I'm not a philosophy student. I wouldn't be, you know, prepared to do that. So really what I want to focus this talk on is specifically on sort of why it is that so many self-proclaimed individualists um, are actually committing a huge like logical issue or you know inconsistency in claiming to be against things like identity politics or other things that they brand as collectivist. So there's one point from the article that I wrote, queerness is not collectivist, uh, reactionaries are not individualists, where I'm specifically sort of just calling that inconsistency a task. Um, specifically, if I can pull that up really quickly, um, is specifically like the second to last bit. It's not that long, actually. Um, it, it's, well, among other things. So 
I claim specifically that it's categorically anti-individualist to claim that all human beings can be classified into one of two roles within society. Basically, the framework of gender, even if you put it in a sense of like biological gender or physical gender, something like that, in my mind, like as someone who's committed to, you know, individual uniqueness, in fact, that's what I base a lot of my own sort of anarchism on, is if that is your goal, right, is to look at the unique expression of all individuals, then you kind of have to reject a lot of categories with that. You have to acknowledge maybe that within the 7 billion plus people that are on this planet, maybe just two categories isn't enough to really capture the full like diversity of the human experience, right? Does that make sense? I think it did. So I think another key point that I really want to focus on, just again at the beginning here, is the role of a, sort of a concept of essence, or in my case, the lack thereof. So I'm going to frame this in the context of a you know story that was very early on in college for me when it was that I actually was coming out because for me queer anarchism or queerness and specifically my own experience with it is where a lot of my opinions that I'm going to be sort of spouting out in, you know onto your screens right now it, it stems from that experience. So I'll just lay that out there sort of as fully as I can. Um, initially, when it was that I was figuring out that, you know, I was non-binary, um, you know, basically that the whole gender thing was something I didn't, uh, and I, I didn't want to fake so long anymore, it just got too costly, um, couldn't afford the clothes, but the way that I sort of helped deal with a lot of dysphoria I had was specifically in thinking about gendering of body parts, right? It's like, most of, you know, it's like a lot of us are in America here, you know, uh, women have these uh, and, and others do not. So that statement isn't really speaking to any like objective truth, right? Though, you know, breasts and gigantic dicks would still exist absent the concept of gender. I think that is like fairly uncontroversial. Uh, if it is, I, I'm just gonna leave it out there anyway. I don't care. But the, the thing that really helped me, like as just a person with anxiety and mild gender dysphoria, really get over those things is realizing that, that there's a separation there. There's a separation between what actually, you know, assuming that you know, there, there are people that are in philosophy programs that might disagree whether or not a reality exists, but assuming that there is like a material reality, right? that there's things you can sort of touch, feel, and perceive through senses. There is a difference between that realm of discussion and talking about essentially like what is underneath that. You know, is there an essentially gendered part of the body or gendered way of presenting? And really what helped me through that is, you know, obviously I heard this from another person who had been sort of in the process of, well, you know, they, they came out way earlier than me. They had been out for longer as if that's not to speak to any like objective experience there, but that, you know, speaking, you know, sort of, uh, you know, NB to NB, Dembo to Dembo, you know, like there was a shared experience there and it helped both of us, um, you know, get through that experience and really have, I think, a better view of sort of positive affirmation of queer identity. So for me, really the long and short of that is that there isn't an objective woman part of the body. There isn't like an objective, really clearly defined like material sort of woman's or men's space. Those are really stuff that when you look at it, right, from the way that we sort of like conceive of those norms, a lot of that is stuff that has been imposed by the state through violence, right? Like actually, you know, Logan initially um, sort of blew my fucking mind initially when I heard about this, is that gendered bathrooms are the result of zoning laws. Like if you look at a lot of legislation about what restaurants are required to do, at least, you know, within the United States, I'm sure this translates to places like the UK, you'll notice that they actually do have to, you know, have these specifically labeled spaces. And obviously there used to be a more sort of, and, and in some cases maybe still, 
a practical justification behind that, but that's certainly a huge part of, you know, again, maybe not a huge part, but a significant part of, you know, the gendered experience within a roughly sort of, I guess you could say, you know, cis heteronormative society. I'm using a lot of big words. Uh, and if at any point you have questions about that, just feel free to ask those. If I'm going too fast, just again, feel free to, you know, bug me about it. Um, but really taking those premises into account, I think like moving forward with it, you know, basically the sort of non-essential nature of gender, basically talking about how that, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, this mask gets very, very warm. I didn't know that. So what I'm trying to argue for just generally as a political project is that this idea of queerness, just specifically deviation from an established norm like we have right now. Say for example, like being an anarchist is a form, or at least you know, claiming to be one, is a form of political queerness. You're associating, roughly speaking, with an identity that is not in line with statism, is not in line with liberalism or capitalism. You have effectively at that point declared yourself uh, sort of separate from the political norm in most cases, you know, I wish that everyone was an egoist and we just gave away free shit, but alas, we do not live in a perfect world. So really what I'm talking about with a commitment to individualism, right, is that it kind of has to address that, right? And this is an issue, I think, especially with a lot of people that are influenced by Rand, influenced by a lot of the classical liberals and sort of, you know, what we might call now like radical liberals. Um, basically of like the early 20th century and even back then, you know, further back is what I meant to say. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that basically says like, oh, well, gay people have a mental problem. So that's probably why we don't like them or, or, or something like that. I am not a, like, my, my expertise on like why it is people claimed their homophobia was justified uh, is not really there. It's not something I enjoy looking into. But to uh, give some semblance of structure, back to what I'm saying here, uh, assuming there's anything there at all, is really the fact that a lot of people claim to oppose certain elements of queer expression, specifically, again, talking about in the sort of GSRM sense, that they don't line up with the logic of, you know, basic, like being pro-individual, right? So uh, say for example, a claim that I remember hearing a lot sort of in like the post Gamergate days, a lot of self-proclaimed rationalists or classical liberals, <coughs> Sargon of Akkad, basically said things such as safe spaces need to be banned or something. You know, we need to suspend social justice courses and fight Marxism in universities and you know, all of that other weird sort of I guess what would eventually become QAnon stuff. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But effectively what you have there is this call for suppression, again, just undeniably a suppression of academic freedom for the sake of someone else's free speech. So what happens in that, not exactly in that moment, but through that process of just sending out that message that, these people need to be like suppressed and these people need to be saying something else in order to protect a freedom of speech. At that point, we're kind of outside the framework of individualism, which for me is just really like, you know, individual good, collective, largely speaking, not, not as good, you know, not entirely bad, but you know, just, you know, they're over there. Um, since my focus is primarily on individual expression, uniqueness, the idea that just it exists as a thing, right? Is that freedom of speech isn't at that point, you know, to borrow something from Sterner, you're at that point kind of, you know, suppressing unique expression, whether it be an interest in social justice or a legitimate like interest in Marxism academically. At that point, you are sort of suppressing uniqueness for the sake of holding up this fixed idea of free speech that must be defended through force. 
And, you know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's like, I am an advocate of total freedom of speech. This, this, is, this would not happen if there were, you know, <laughs> rules within society that dictated, uh, you know, whether or not I could really wear this. But to get back sort of on point, I'm sorry, I'm sort of a little bit unstructured here. You know, I thought that spontaneous order would kick in at some point, but, you know, here we are. Thank you, Rothbard. Um, really, what it is I want to get to is that queerness and just deviation from really just the idea of a norm at all existing, either post-state or currently advocating for a norm's continued existence or imposition, that to me doesn't line up with the idea of, you know, individual egos or selves basically being the sort of corner, being sort of like the central part of your analysis. At that point, it seems more to represent what is often, you know, sort of, what's sort of loaded off onto self or yeah, basically what people accuse collectivists of being right. You know, these people that want to take away your ability to say whatever the fuck you want. People that keep, you know, restricting how many don't tread on me flags you can put onto your shirt or whatnot. I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you people think, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, I think that's really, you know, that contradiction, oddly enough, is how you get people like, you know, self-proclaimed cultural libertarians. And that was actually a point that I wanted to get to earlier, but I'll kind of just limp my way back to right now. So, you know, for those of you that were, you know, very politically active in sort of radical spaces around, like, I think two or three years ago at, at this point, there, there really hasn't been a lot of buzz about this. A lot of figures have either gone full alt-right, sort of QAnon conspiracy type shit, or, you know, just gotten out and, you know, become something less radical altogether. But there was a few figures that started being bunched together as this group of what was called cultural libertarians. And one thing that sort of separated them out from like mainstream sort of Ron Paul libertarians was their adamant sort of claim that social movements should be treated in the same way as states, i.e., you know, basically as entities to be opposed, basically as kind of, uh, and again, this, this could very well be exaggerated because it has been a while since I've investigated this in any depth. But the way in which they frame, you know, social justice as this monolithic sort of, again, intentionally so, a state-like formation that basically pushes out propaganda, is able to, you know, control public discourse, basically is something that needs to be abolished. That's fucked up on so many levels. Uh, most importantly of which, you know, I, I keep being myself, on the level of just individual expression. Because oddly enough, all of these, you know, self-proclaimed cultural libertarians were at least to the like 90 percent of them, if not all, uh, were white sort of upper middle class level. Like there was a clear demographic there of mostly privileged, mostly, you know, to include Milo Yiannopoulos because, you know, we, we don't live in a perfect world, right, is mostly straight white people that eventually became, you know, outright white nationalists, worked for Breitbart. So again, it, it was pretty obvious to see the connections there. The problem with basically putting social justice and putting all of these people, you know, that effectively are like me, sort of, in, in more one, you know, in one way or more, is that you, again, are creating this sort of monolithic entity that doesn't necessarily exist. That's you know, again, another example of, you know, what Sterner would call a fixed idea, right? It's something that more or less these people came up with, right? And social justice movements exist in, you know, not the same sense as like the, you know, not in the same sense as ICE, right? Like, S, you know, SJWs are not ICE. I know that's a radical statement. I don't know how the fuck we got to the point where I'm even saying that, but you know what? It's my fault. I'll take the blame for it. So in, for one, like erasing the uniqueness that, you know, basically allows individuals to get to that point, right? To find communities of, you know, like-minded people that also do not identify with either gender and want to make spaces to affirm that. 
by doing so, uh, basically just you know opposing all of that stuff, cultural libertarians and a lot of people that claim to be individualists or classical liberals or whatnot are actually like anything but, you know, they, they might be able to stuff like some kind of bullshit in there to make the classical liberal label stick. But uh, you know what, fuck you, Dave Rubin, I don't care. <laughs> so really what my main, so, where, where do I wanna go with this? This is, a, this is a good question. So initially I did wanna make this more of a back and forth discussion and that's part of, you know, that's something that you know, the technology has limited us from to some degree, but I still kind of want to leave a lot more time for just questions and sort of going back and forth since I know that our schedule is a little bit backed up. Um, but, uh, you know, what? I, I'm just going to keep going for a little bit until somebody tells me to stop. It's only like 117. So, you know what? It's, this is, this is spontaneous order. This is the, the anarchy of discussions really. So, one other thing that I want to point out is the fact that, you know, I think, where, where do I want to go with this? That is a, that's also a good question from me to, to myself. I think the more sort of, I think, honestly, instead of bringing up cultural libertarianism, I could have talked about this, which is what I'm going to do right now, is particularly the idea of transgender ideology. Oddly enough, this is something that still happens to the far left, right? It's like, just saying that, it sounds like I'm parodying some QAnon spokesperson. And, you know, a lot of QAnon people do say transgender ideology, but I most strongly associate it with figures like Caleb Maupin. Uh, and that's the only time I'm going to say that person's name because they don't deserve my attention. But the idea of transgender ideology, just for one, as a concept, it, it doesn't make, like... Yeah, a bunch of people agreeing that affirming people's gender identities and using their preferred pronouns and names is an ideology. I mean, you know, I'm easily convinced of a lot of weird shit, so you could probably give me, uh, like, a, no, no, I'm not even going to touch that. I, I'm just going to dismiss that argument. It's not an ideology, and the way in which that's being used is basically just to, again, remove uniqueness from the discussion. The idea that a bunch of these people are coming together to, you know, basically suppress freedom of expression and all of that as an excuse to do the same back to them, that, it, again, it just doesn't add up, right? It leads to ends which are fundamentally collectivist. It's just that, again, you can couch collectivism in a lot of, you know, very, very compelling ways. Um, you know, for example, you can just say that it is individualist to do all of this stuff that just, you know, is blatantly violent, blatantly oppressive. So that's, I think, as best I can unpack that point about how, you know, these movements which call themselves rationalists or, you know, otherwise sort of opposing in, you know, basically being opponents to impose norms while also basically imposing a set of norms forcibly themselves. Like there's a weird sort of, you know, non-aggression principle style, like eye for an eye sort of thing going on there. And I don't think that's something that we should like ever encourage uh, if we can help it. There is another element to this that I wanna bring up as well in a piece that we actually haven't released yet with Center for State and Society, but I wanna touch on that uh, anyway, because I think that it's it's incredibly important to discussing like any idea of individualism. So I've talked a lot of shit about right wingers that aren't a part of the queer community in any you know conceivable sense. At least you know they're being transphobic enough to the point that they want to be excluded almost. But I want to point out how within like queer spaces, within radical spaces, even you still have some problems that will arise from not recognizing unique expression as a cornerstone in your politics. If there was one point to take away from this entire thing that I'm going to try and draw out for a little bit longer, it's that I think any politics that disregards uniqueness, specifically the fact that individual people are just totally unique 
individuals are able to, you know, there's always going to be exceptions to certain models. If you try and find commonalities between every human being on the planet, it's just not going to work. There are always going to be those exceptions. So fundamentally, I think the, you know, and also we, any one of us in any case could be one of those exceptions. That's always a possibility because those models are fundamentally flawed. They don't take into consideration individual uniqueness. So I just realized I wanted to sort of take a moment to define that. And I think that the core to any consistently, you know, not just individualist politic, but any successful non, you know, collectivist and oppressive politic needs to take that into consideration or else, you know, you get into issues of erasure. And I want to point out the sort of, how do, how do I put this? I'm starting to make up words. So we're at a good point in this discussion. Um, sort of the erasive behaviors, I, I guess, that I see a lot of progressive members of, you know, or progressive queer people, just progressives in general, honestly, um, that really kind of make queer, make the sort of idea of a queer community into something more akin to what, you know, homophobes and bigots would characterize us as. So say, for example, you have the issue of, you know, anti-discrimination laws. That's obviously something that, you know, a lot of, you know, liberal support, they like the fact that, you know, what Biden did with all of the, you know, executive orders and whatnot. And, you know, as someone who is very clearly not a Democrat liberal at all, right? If, if I were, I'd be doing a really bad job of letting y'all know that, is that the, the, you know, I don't view the state as my friend in almost any sense of the word. Like, sure, they're not literally putting me into a camp yet, but it, it it's basically like, you know, I don't want the, I don't want governments to step in and have to solve the issues that, you know, they admittedly kind of started. They basically made them as bad as they are now. So, you know what, uh, fuck off. Don't give me help I didn't ask for. So the issue, of course, is that when you start thinking of a queer voting block, for example, as a lot of politicians likely do, as a lot of political analysts also, you know, fall into, you know, the problem of, you start getting this sort of warped consensus idea of like, what an ideal sort of queer person or an ideal, you know, just member of any community is supposed to be in sort of creating this artificial community, um, you know, what I would call sort of a fixed union, the idea of, you know, being part of this community, whether you like it or not, that is to me like, uh, you know, that is sort of the end point of denying uniqueness. The thing that I don't think anyone should partake so anyone should participate in at any point, right? <clears throat> okay, breath taken, let's go. So this piece that I'll, you know, hopefully have out in a little while, not, not too long, is specifically called My Union Based on Nothing. And it's, again, talking more about essence, but what I want to pull from this is the idea of fixed unions, specifically just being lumped together with a bunch of other people. Even calling, you know, like anarchists a community has some, you know, deep issues with it. It's obviously not to the point where I won't use that term anymore descriptively, but there's some prescriptive issues that I really want to focus on for the rest of this talk. So <clears throat> in creating this idea of, you know, a community, right, basically without you know, thinking about it just as a grouping of individuals. When you stop looking at it through the lens of uniqueness, people basically coming together due to shared interest in each other or shared interest in another thing. When you start looking at it as just these people are here because they are in the same class or because they are in the same, you know, ethnic identity, they're part of the same race even, you know, that's something that they very well may you know, describe their union, you know, through that lens, right? I'm trying my hardest not to sound pretentious. It is really tough. But really what I'm trying to get to there is when you start creating that 
idea of a union that basically is between you and someone else because of a shared characteristic as the sole foundation of it, that's when you start to create the idea of an ideal person, right? In order to sort of conceive of that union independently of unique ideas, or at least without unique individuals as your sort of baseline, you start to get this conception of, well, in order to be a part of this community or to be a better part of this fixed union here, the, you know, I have to be more like this roughly constructed sort of ideal person. You know, there is the idea of the model minority. This is something that, you know, I have a lot of personal experience with as someone with, you know, a, you know, an Asian background. There is a lot of rhetoric that, you know, made by other people that were planning to, you know, advocate for folks like me that kind of forcibly tokenized a lot of our, you know, achievements, a lot of what we were doing. So, and you see, even in just me referring to myself as a member of that community, it's like, I'm not entirely, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want unions to model that sort of level of interaction where it is that I'm talking about sort of us as a begrudging thing. I think that ultimately what I'm kind of trying to get to, like the real core of it, is the fact that I want more relationships to you know, really resemble sort of friendships and actual bonds with human beings rather than just loose associations of just you know, rough or arbitrary categories in a lot of ways. I think really to demonstrate like the level to which an arbitrary category like gender is interlaced with the state and why I think that's a huge part of, you know, my just approach to knowledge <laughs> itself, uh, you know, with something we definitely have time to solve uh, within this panel. Uh, voice cracks, they're funny. So <clears throat> my real sort of like moment where I realized that, you know, the state was never going to be a, a great queer ally is when I read a very, very like short piece, honestly, by the author uh, Anne Foster Sterling. And you've probably heard about this uh, at some point if you're at all familiar with this kind of general discourse. If not, like still look it up, it's, it's really great. Uh, is Anne Foster Sterling's The Five Sexes. And she, she did a follow up to this, of course, you know, talking about, you know, why, you know, she didn't, you know, like reflecting on her work, it's really awesome. Uh, it's basically talking about how there is a lot of sort of circular reasoning, and she doesn't explicitly say this, but this is the main draw that I get out of it, you know, as one of the people she's talking about, someone who doesn't conform to, well, she, to, to characterize it accurately, is mainly talking about intersex people. That's not my experience, but I felt there were a lot of parallels to the non-binary experience. Um, and, and that's just me saying what it is that I got out of it. I'm not speaking to any like, objective like real thesis there so really what it is that she's saying there is that you could if you know you, one so desired which she demonstrates very you know act very well in the piece is the idea that there are at least five sexes five sort of physical manifestations that you know of you know just of the gendered body more or less that have both features from sort of both sides of the aisle. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think of a better way to say it and I can't. Um, and the ultimate argument that she kind of makes there that really highlights, you know, the state's involvement with this, or not, not just the state even, but sort of like medical hegemony, right? Is that in order to prove the idea that there are two genders, we need to constantly correct nature's mistakes. And, you know, obviously that's an incredibly, like I felt sick saying that, is that there are obvious problems with that that are very deeply rooted in an idea that we somehow have this, you know, link with what nature intended to do. Um, and apparently that doesn't include, um, you know, some people having testes when they're not supposed to. It's, you know, it's a very problematic framework. But I think what it really illustrates is that no matter what kind of categorization we use, Sterling suggests that we just don't use one and just at the very least, like look at 
physical, you know, sort of sexed traits on this sort of spectrum. She actually, I think, explicitly says that we are not a sexually dimorphous species. I'm not entirely familiar with what our current, like, scientific meta is with the language there, and it doesn't matter for the point that I'm trying to make, is that, you know, in the realm of biology, you could codify things a little bit more tightly. And, you know, if you want to do that, you know, don't, don't talk about it with me because I don't care really. Um, but when it comes to socially constructed categories, these things which, again, we fucking made, we have the ability to change at any point, um, is is that, yeah, you don't need those categories. There's not really an empirical backing behind the idea that, you know, having just two social roles or even just a small, like a single digit number of, you know, gender expressions and identities is a good idea. I, I don't know if it like lowers the crime rate or makes people less horny. I don't, I don't know what it does. Uh, if someone could explain that to me, uh, you know, who am I kidding? No, no one can claim that. There's nothing that can back up a statement like that. And what it is that I'm kind of saying with the, you know, whole sort of uh, queerness as individualism thing is really more a statement about how uniqueness and just recognizing it, it demands you throw out a lot of categorizations that otherwise, you know, make just talking about these issues otherwise very, very convenient. Because honestly, because we have been doing this thing, which I really just do not agree with for so long, it's tough to talk about issues that, you know, affect marginalized groups, you know, just me talking about that to contextualize it. It's difficult to do that without, you know, sort of doing a little bit of that erasure I was talking about earlier talking about how, you know, this general group of people, which I kind of arbitrarily made up of, say, for example, poor people of color or just low income, you know, not just to use a you know, non-classist term, that in itself, what I'm doing there is kind of erasing the idea that, you know, every person within that category that I arbitrarily assigned has their own sort of unique elements to, you know, the struggle that they as a unique individual face. Like that took so much longer than just saying this, you know, what marginalized people experience, right? So I hope that that makes the point a little bit clearer. Uh, if it didn't, as usual, just, you know, follow up questions, just, you know, bombard me with stuff. I, I basically, I'm literally asking you to do it. So I think that, it's difficult to apply a lot of this stuff. Just, you know, the there's a little, you know, sort of thing at the back of my head saying I haven't talked about solutions much. I've mostly, you know, hopefully talked about just the problem really that I see, which is um, sort of arbitrary collectivization and basically sort of submitting to a lot of fixed ideas like binary gender, like even, you know, even a strict two sex model, you know, human sexual dimorphism all of that stuff, which is, you know, since been proven at the very least, not totalizing, like it's not a framework that's always, you know, accurate. No framework is. That's kind of, you know, a sort of sub point there. What I see is sort of the, what I see is, again, I think another implication that I'm trying to get sort of through this as, as loosely as possible is just like the fact that I don't, I think it's difficult to apply a lot of this stuff within the current context in which we live. Like, especially in the United States, we're living in a, you know, democracy, you know, we can have that discussion any day, it, where a lot of people are put into distinct voting groups. There are a lot of politicized interests. There is a lot of stuff which, you know, the state has claimed they can help us with, in some cases, they kind of maybe, yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. Uh, it, it's like there's a lot of, you know, we're put into a lot of boxes right now. There is a lot of, you know, certain collectivizations and examples of anti-individualism in a very non-individualist society like we have right now. So really more of what I'm talking about is kind of like, post-state, like, bike shedding a little bit, sort of a response to that. 
specifically just this is kind of how I would at least advocate social relations turn, I guess. I'm not really trying to impose any framework here. That's that's kind of the difficulty with this, is I'm more talking about why they're all bad and we shouldn't use them. <laughs> but yeah, to sort of summarize, I guess, there, there really isn't that much more I can add, I, I don't think. But my main sort of concern, I guess, to, to put it as moderately as possible, is that within even as radically anti-statist and anti-authoritarian a space as is, you know, ours, I'm, I'm sure that there is, you know, between like whoever is watching this right now, there are some people that don't want to associate explicitly with the label of like anarcho-communism or something like that. But, you know, most people watching at least have some issues with you know, at least the currently existing governments they live under, right? So establishing that, you know, that took way too fucking long, is the is that I think an issue that we can all sort of fall into sometimes, the sort of problematic behavior, I guess, to, to use a term, um, is that a lot of us kind of forget that there is a lot of diversity within a lot of these struggles, whether we call them class struggles or, you know, for example, uh, the, you know, that, that's really the, the best example there is like, for example, the framework of class struggles as a lot of, you know, leftists and communists would use. There's, you know, a huge tendency, of course, of class reductionism, um, you know, basically reducing all struggles to that which is, you know, just inherent to your economic standing in whatever, you know, in whatever place you may be, that, you know, say, for example, basically class reductionism is bad and we have to, you know, spend more time and just active, like, conscious deliberation on, you know, people that really kind of, you know, on people that deviate from that norm, really. Because my main point all the way back when I was just starting this sort of long unstructured grant is the fact that really just the idea of a norm isn't something that's really conducive to our other political goals. Because say for example, again, it's like I, I think I'm probably a, an extreme case of this. But, you know, say, for example, someone like me, I don't particularly like any idea of even small, like, even like municipalist models of government, I think have issues inherent to, you know, the fact that they are governments, they function on a roughly similar level or, you know, with similar mechanics in mind. Um, is like, for someone who is as radically anti-order in general, not just anti-state or anti-government, anti-capitalist, but specifically against sort of monolithic societal order as a thing we should advocate for, it doesn't make much sense for you know someone like me to then advocate that everyone sort of roughly speaking sort of follow this middle point like this is kind of how i conceive of a norm within society uh just using all of my hand gestures today is that most people it's kind of like if you look at this as a bell curve like most people think of populations in terms of bell curves. People think of behaviors in terms of that in a lot of ways, at least in my experience. Of course, there are deviations here. Is that I think that when you look at most behaviors and assume that just, you know, everyone that does X or everyone that has this certain trait will do a specific set of things with some deviation, I think that's like the inverse of the approach I'm talking about. Because when you get rid of, you know, a lot of institutions that prop up the current institution of, you know, state capitalism, you start to realize that you can't really enforce a norm, or at least you shouldn't be able to. If you can, then I'm going to go over to wherever you are and throw Molotovs at the state that you've made. No, it, it is a state. You can call it something different. But uh, so really what I'm thinking of when it is that I, you know, sort of conceive of stateless society as best, you know, as you could define that, is that it's one where you don't have these norms, where queerness, in an ironic sense, kind of is just what everyone is doing. I think that in order to get to that sort of state or, you know, sort of position in society, right, 
You, you can't really call it a state. If you can, then something went wrong. But you want to get to this point where queerness is sort of at the, you know, not necessarily a core element there, but it's a thing that you prioritize, right? It's something you have to consciously, you know, think about when it is that you're trying to apply these ideas. Because I think a huge issue with, for example, like I've written about vulgar AMCOMs or whatnot, or even, you know, AMCAPs are guilty of this too, libertarians, a lot of political thinking gets into this idea of creating a new norm. And what I'm sort of trying to say, and I'm not the first to say this, I'll, I'll admit that is something that, you know, I share with other people that write the Center for State and Society now, um, and other people that don't matter as much. But the thing that really, you know, gets to me is that I don't think a politics of creating new norms is something that, you know, we as like anarchists or even like radical libertarians is, I don't think that's something that we should embrace, right? It's kind of like uh, making the, you know, it's kind of like making, you know, the USSR part two, that's for the tankies to do, or, you know, basically make whatever 1984 analogous thing that, you know, was popular that week on Twitter is we're not necessarily in the business of creating just this new like template for society to be organized on. I think what really is a huge conclusion of statelessness and anti-authoritarianism, and in some cases, anti-collectivism, depending on how you define that term, is that you don't really have room for structure building anymore. Like these tools which we're using to criticize just the nature of structure itself, just the nature of societal order itself, they're not great if you want to build something. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, hammers and nails are what you use to put together a house, uh, not this gigantic fucking flamethrower of, uh, you know, egoist ideas or whatnot. I think that that's kind of closer to where I want to end this, uh, maybe a little early even, uh, because, you know, I've kind of gone all over the place. My TLDR really, or too long didn't watch, uh, even though you should have been watching, is, you know, Queerness is something I think that's a huge part of any consistently individualist sort of political view or philosophical standpoint. And in order to get to, you know, in order to create, I guess, a healthier sort of radical space or one that is more successful in the more sort of like main goals that we have, I think that acknowledging queerness and really embracing that aspect of individual expression and recognizing that there are deviations from any norm that you may use for anything. Like this is, this, this really is getting into, you know, some philosophy shit here. I ah, promise we wouldn't do that is yeah. Basically if we want to achieve our goals in the ways that we actually, you know, are sort of conceiving of them right now is we kind of need to acknowledge queerness. We need to acknowledge people that, aren't necessarily going to fit into our desired way of doing things. Like say, for example, if I am a proponent of free market, like left wing style, you know, basically whatever, you know, say for example, I want Gary Chartier to make his own like ideal utopia and make us all live under it. There's gonna be some people for whom that's not going to work as well. There's going to be some areas in which that does not just function like geographically or due to resource imbalances that, you know, hopefully would be caused by supply and demand or maybe a hurricane happened. I don't know. I don't run your life. And I think that's really where we have to be at as sort of not necessarily more principled anarchists. I wouldn't even use that term, but people that are sort of, I think for our goals as state abolitionists, as, you know, you know, anti-capitalists, we need to acknowledge queerness and deviation from norms if we're going to actually like accomplish those things. That's a huge part of counter economics, alternative institutions, like we were mentioning earlier on the panel with Kevin Carson, is that there isn't going to be one model, right? And I think, you know, obviously that applies to economic models, but we also have to look at that kind of as a way to criticize social models. Like the idea of affinity groups, not everyone's going to want to give away their fucking tools. You know, it's like, I don't have any, I want to give away really. It's like, I like those things. I could 
fuck somebody up with that. Um, is yeah, you know, there are going to be issues with any model you try to apply to social organization. I think that as sort of eh, not, not anti-organizationalists, but as people that could arguably be called anti-societyists, it's kind of necessary for us to really look at the people who those other models don't serve. We have to sort of think about, say, for example, why a narrative of class consciousness doesn't include people, for example, that are not currently working, that cannot work. That's a huge problem with what you might call workerism. Um, and there's elements of workerism you can draw from that will lead you to good conclusions. But really, just to hammer the point home, because I, I feel like I'm kind of repeating myself a lot, um, sorry, is that, you know, queerness is an important part of, you know, just, again, any politics, even if it's not explicitly individualist. And if you want to achieve your goals in a way that's sustainable, or if you want to achieve at least, you know, the goals that I have in mind, for example, of general, like, stateless society, everybody, you know, doing roughly speaking, whatever the fuck they want, uh, you you can't do that without acknowledging uniqueness, without acknowledging queerness, just as a concept, just epistemologically, whatever other terms you fancy philosophy majors use. Uh, that That's pretty much it. Basically, queerness is awesome. Individuals uh, absolutely rock. Uh, I have been your host, and that that's pretty much it. Just, just think about queerness, really vibe with it. Uh, smoke some weed and maybe this will make sense to you. Uh, please read my things. <laughs> and where can people read your work if they're interested? E so uh, you can read my work at c4ss dot org slash content slash author slash spooky. You can also follow me on Twitter at spooked hands because that meme will never die. It's still good. Uh, it's very funny. And yeah, I think that's pretty much, uh, oh yeah, check out the complete anarchy discord. Maybe, uh, we might let you in if you're not terrible. So yeah, you, you should do that. <laughs> You mean that Discord that's run by C4SS, right? Uh, no, 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 no. This one's run by Libcom.org uh, and funded by Soros. So, you know, actually, no, wait, funded by the Gravel Institute. There we go. <laughs> nice, nice. Wonderful combination. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Spooky. I know uh, we really appreciate it, honestly. It's been fun having you, and I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, maybe you can join us on the Egoism panel tomorrow if you're free. Ooh, I was wondering why I wasn't there, but it's okay. I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, come, 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 join, come join them. But anyways... <laughs> Thank you so much, and I will let you go. Awesome, awesome. Thank you.